So to right now we have Chris and Rebecca from Kentucky Science Center, and they are going to talk to us about authentic connections and using empathy to reimagine our relationships with patrons. So thank you both for being here and doing this for us. No worries. Thank you for having us. Um, if at any point in time anybody can't hear us or anything like that, feel free to let us know. Uh, there will be time for some questions at the end as well. Um, and please, if you think of a question, just drop it in the chat. Um, we'll, this is kind of a uh, give and take style presentation here. Uh, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, something called authentic connections, give you kind of the thousand yard view of what this is and how we utilize this with uh, science and Play and, and Science Play to Go and here at the flagship and various other libraries. Uh, bear in mind, though, that everything we talk about is just really scratching the surface of, of what this is and how it's used. Uh, so this is kind of designed to be the, the introduction, not the, not the complete exhaustive uh, look at this. So uh, we'll get started with who are these two goofy people in orange lab coats that are staring at you from, Kentucky, from Louisville here? Well, here we are. <laughs> Hi, I am Rebecca Russ. I am both an educator and science and play to go liaison here at the Kentucky Science Center. Um, I graduated from the University of Tennessee with a bachelor's in geography. And I've always been really passionate about early childhood education and science. So using uh, our science and play to go program, I'm able to bring science education across the entire state of Kentucky. Uh, and uh, I'm Chris McEachran. Uh, you see I have a little less hair uh, in that picture than I do now. But uh, I'm the manager of visitor engagement here. Uh, I got my undergraduate degree in uh, outdoor education uh, from Murray State University uh, a long time ago. And my master's degree in experiential education from Minnesota State University uh, not, not too long ago. Um, my thing is learning. I love learning. I love seeing how people learn and exploring what that means. So it makes the, uh, the relationships that, that I've built through the Science Center and, and through uh, KDLA and, and the various libraries around the state really exciting. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about here, um, what we're gonna talk about here is caregiver involvement. So we have, uh, as many of you do, lots of people that come in and to the science center or to our, our remote locations as family unit units or or adult caregiver with children and it's always desirable to have caregiver involvement in a really strong way so i want to introduce this presentation with uh with an email that i got uh from a uh from another educator at an emerging children's museum not too far away uh, pretty recently, just uh, just two or three months ago. Um, I'm going to read this so I don't misquote here. But she said, Chris, our museum struggles a bit with engaging students in engaging parents in play alongside their children. Any guidance or advice you have would be very much appreciated. And I thought about that and thought that this email is kind of fortuitous here because Rebecca and I were actively creating this presentation uh, for, the, for, for this conference. And the questions that this educator asked are really relevant to what we're talking about today. How do we get uh, adult involvement? How do we create this, this opportunity to, to be engaged? Um, it's the age-old question. It's one that I've been struggling with my entire professional career. Uh, it's the one that we constantly ask our educators, constantly ask our play specialists all over the place. Uh, and we're going to come back to this, this question. But this question is going to drive the, the, the presentation for us here. We're going to come back to, to kind of what we said. But first, I want to give you a little bit of food for thought. So for this next bit, uh, feel free to un, unmute. We're going to ask for some some group involvement here. All right, so we're gonna give you three different scenarios and we wanna hear what your thoughts are, uh, how you might act in this situation. All right, first, there are two to three children playing in your facility. The adult caregiver is sitting at a table intensely focused on their phone. 
the children are progressively getting more rowdy. What's what going? Are you there, Sorry. <laughs> What's going through your mind, and what do you do? Go ahead and drop some thoughts in the chat, or you can unmute and tell us what you think. What do you think of when you see an adult paying more attention to their phone than to the kids that they brought to your library? Do you guys ever see this happen? Because we certainly <laughs> do <laughs> very often. I can't find the chat box, but I, yes, I see it all the time. Yeah, the uh, chat box, I think if you click the little uh, purple arrows on the bottom right corner, uh, chat's, chat's in there. But yeah, you see it all the time. The caregiver wants a break. Stay out of the situation, but sometimes calm down the children. Yeah. The library's a babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly feel that way sometimes. Absolutely. It, it sounds, it, maybe maybe they're working, right? Mm. Some, some, some empathy. Playing, playing with that. It wakes the caregiver up, so it's, okay, right on. You can kind of bring bring some light to the situation for the caregiver. I take that. Yeah. Yeah, totally valid responses. Seems like a, a little bit of an element of exasperation at the very least, right? Yeah. And, and maybe some corrective actions. Yeah. All right, on the next. An individual comes into your facility with two young children in tow. The youngest child is crying loudly. The older one asks the adult for a particular book and the adult yells at them for interrupting. What's going through your mind? What might you do? I'll tell you, for me, I get really uncomfortable when I, when I see someone yelling. Yes. Uh, I kind of just want to phase out. I can. It can be a tough one. Yeah. Any other thoughts? There we go. Oh, right on. Yeah. Offer to help the child who is looking for a book. Kind of take some of that stress away. Yeah. Let's jump on to our next one. Yeah, we got a couple more. Volunteer to help. Help them find what they're looking for. Awesome. So maybe the common theme here is is taking the, the stress away from that particular parent and trying to resolve the, the, the initial issue. Yeah. Right on. All right. Our third scenario. Three children are running around your facility throwing everything they can reach onto the ground. Their adult care is enmeshed in a book, not paying any attention to the children. <laughs> this is a fun one. <laughs> what might we do here? We chose that picture <laughs> intentionally here. <laughs> yes, yeah, a friendly reminder that they're going to have to pick that back up. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tabitha, you want to come hang out at the uh, the Science Center? You're welcome to do that as well. <laughs> we, we struggle with that. Oh, okay. Yeah. We got here. Step in front of them and remind them it's not safe for other people if they run in the library. Yeah. yeah. We definitely use the phrase walking feet often. <laughs> More often than I'd like to. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Now we're getting some responses. Get their attention and explain the library is not a playground. Redirect their energy to a game or a puzzle. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth, you had this just happen the <laughs> other day, huh? <laughs> nice. Walking feet inside voices. Yeah. Right. You know, these, these, are, uh, these are pretty common tropes that I think we all see, uh, whether it's libraries, science centers, museums, schools, what have you, these are things that happen pretty frequently. Uh, so 
So how do we get caregivers to fully engage with that space? Uh, well, I'm going to go back in time a little bit here. Uh, caregiver involvement may actually be that uh, that white unicorn that doesn't exist that we're we're searching for in maybe some of the wrong places. So believe it or not, I was not always here at the Kentucky Science Center, although sometimes I wish that I was. It's a very cool place here. How about seven unsupervised <laughs> tweens beating each other with puppets? Yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> that's a thing. How are your puppets? I hope they emerged unscathed <laughs> from that. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> So they're still recovering. They're still recovering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I actually got my museum start uh, far north of here, Children's Museum of Southern Minnesota. Um, and at the time, I was a very different educator than I am now, I hope. Uh, at, the, at the time, I was very, very much into uh, making adults engage with their kids in the way that I saw best. Um, did that with not so subtle wording and and maybe not so welcoming glances. Uh, I was even a proponent, uh, half joking but half not, of changing our Wi-Fi password to "I really should be playing with my kids right now." Um, <laughs> you know, I figured, why are you going to bring your kids to a place like this without interacting with them? There's so much benefit that can be had by uh by engaging with these activities or, or or these books or the the games uh with your kids uh if caregivers in got involved they get they could they could get some benefit themselves we know that play and and learning is universal across all ages uh our stuff would last longer maybe our puppets wouldn't go shoeless <laughs> <laughs> So hopefully that gets sorted. Uh, and you know, I th I think I think the kids that came to our spaces would actually get a lot more out of the experience as well. Um, so while I was in Minnesota, I was introduced to something that was coming out of St. Paul called the Wakanja Project. Now, uh, Wakanja, uh, the Wakanja Project started in 2004 at the Ramsey County Library. That's uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, the Wakanja Project. Uh, started in 2004 as a uh, abuse prevention uh, model, which was really kind of cool. The word Wakanja is a Dakota word for child and literally translates to sacred being. Uh, so Gabrielle Strong, a member of the Dakota Nation, formally gifted the word Wakanja to the Ramsey County uh, Department of Health in 2004 to, to really promote this idea of being, uh, of children being that sacred being. Um, what the, the goal was, instead of recognizing when abuse may be happening, uh, you know, in the, the mandatory reporting and all that, honestly, stressful things, uh, the idea behind the Wakanja Project was to turn abuse prevention into the, the idea through making connections with people and recognizing that, that some of these, these violent projections that are happening uh, are happening due to a variety of reasons. And maybe there's some things that we can do as an organization to, to help prevent them before they start. Uh, so the, uh, the Wakanja project uh, started in 2004, throughout the year kind of molded and modeled into a couple different things. Um, authentic connections is, is what this program is called now, uh, as it has transformed into more than just a abuse prevention uh, model, but instead, into almost a customer service based model of of creating real connections or and it's going to be a surprise authentic connections uh to the, all of our patrons to all of our guests in a way that makes the experience better for everybody makes the learning and and potential gains much greater uh and helps build our community through the process All right, so authentic connections uh, is helping people become more aware of their unconscious biases and methods of othering and using that information to create a more welcoming space. Um, so looking at things like the environment in your library, um, checking your own biases, uh, 
The purpose of the program is to create connectedness, um, reduce isolation, build and strengthen healthy relationships. Um, and it's an ongoing process. It's not it's not a one time sit down and <laughs> watch a presentation. It's constantly looking at things in your organization that you can do better um, and continuing to build on that. So we're going to go really quick through the principles of, of Wakanda, the principles of the sacred being, this, the, the idea that everybody has value and wisdom. And we're going to go through them, like I said, pretty quickly. Um, obviously, as with any set of principles for a thing, we could probably do entire presentations on, on each one of these ideas. But the idea is to kind of get you to think a little bit about how maybe your already implementing some of these ideas uh, in your libraries to, to really create that welcoming sense of place for, for your patrons. So our first one, environment. Environment. Um, environments are not uh, neutral. As soon as you walk into a place, you can sense whether you're welcome, uh, whether you feel at ease or not. Um, you look the physical environment around you. You look at the furniture, uh, the colors, the lighting, um, signage, information, temperature even. Um, and those things can make you feel welcome. It can make you feel threatened or unwanted. Um, some helpful strategies that you can use to make your, uh, your library a more welcoming space. Um, adding toys or child-sized furniture to your lobby or front desk area. Um, sometimes those tall desks can be a little intimidating for kids. They can't see over it. Maybe they feel like they don't belong there while their grown-up is talking. Some toys or smaller furniture could help. Um, speaking of the front desk, you are the first person that they see when they come in, and you can set the entire tone uh, just by a smile or pointing them in the correct direction. So the next thing that we want to think about uh, in creating these welcoming environments is bias. We all have bias. Uh, bias is is a evolved trait that we we uh, we've developed as humans to more quickly process information. It's it's not necessarily a bad thing. Bias is based on our own lived experiences, uh, the environments that we we exist in, and the experiences of those around us. Uh, so here's here's the important thing. Everybody has bias that impacts uh, their judgment. Um, and the the idea with this is not to remove your bias because that's impossible and not realistic and not beneficial either. Uh, but to be aware of it, to be aware of what your your bias is. Um, by implicit bias refers to the attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding actions and decisions in an unconscious manner so if we're aware of that we're more aware of of what this is going to uh to translate to for our patrons so some helpful strategies uh in recognizing bias is is just work on recognizing and acknowledging your bias uh this this happens all the time uh, and we all experience it to learn more about privilege and understand how your identities and circumstances might give you privilege. This could include white privilege, male privilege, Christian privilege, and there's a ton of other examples of, of, of systems that are built in place to make certain groups feel exceedingly welcome. Uh, so we want, really want to pay attention to our blind spots and what that might imply for a welcoming environment. All right, empathy, very important one. They're all important. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> So empathy is really important to understanding how other people feel and how you can help them to respond better in that situation. Um, it requires being genuine and authentic. Uh, it breaks the isolation that people can sometimes feel in a stressful situation if they feel um, impacts of judgment or bias. Um, some helpful strategies here can be to start by looking at yourself and being compassionate to yourself so you can extend that to others. Um, slow down and be fully present when you interact with others. This lets them know that what they're saying and feeling actually matters to you. Acknowledge where you are in the moment and what you are and are not able to offer. 
um, a little empathy goes a long way. And I really love this quote, everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about, be kind. I've heard that forever, but I think it's, I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it. It really kind of throws out the idea that I, I don't know what you've been going through. I don't know what you've, what you've dealt with even that day. Absolutely. Culture. Culture is really important. Uh, culture is a way of life, obviously, uh, of a group of people, the behaviors, beliefs, values, and symbols that they accept, generally without thinking about them. Uh, so culture, and I, I love this way of thinking about it, culture is symbolic communication. It's the things that have value to a particular person or a group of people. It also includes ways of being and unspoken rules of conduct. Uh, here's where it gets kind of interesting to me. No one can understand the culture of another without a relationship. So in order to actually understand where somebody is coming from, we have to get to know them. We have to, to appreciate them. Um, organizations can have culture. It's something maybe a word that we throw around in our organizations and our libraries here, here at the Science Center. We, we talk about culture frequently. Uh, organizations can have culture, and by being aware of what culture we are intending and what culture we're presenting, uh, we can we can be really intentional about being welcome to all folks. So some helpful strategies. Uh, we really want to reach beyond the perceived barriers of difference. Uh, there's far more in common uh, between people than there are differences. With our patrons, there are there are different expectations in different cultures. Uh, so we want to be aware of, of concepts that might be from our own culture uh, with concepts of cleanliness, child rearing, tone of voice, facial expression, roles in relation to age, sex, class, occupation, all of these things, we are all going to see through our own lens. So being aware that something that might upset me were my parents to do this to me as a child might not upset someone else. It might be a totally normal uh, expression of, of how, how they interact with one another. Um, yeah, culture is very important and we live in a very, very multicultural state with very multicultural patrons. We wanna make our space welcoming to everybody. For sure. All right, power. A uh, feeling of powerlessness can lead to frustration and sometimes unwelcome behavior. You might feel powerless when you're running late. Uh, there's no clear signage and you're not sure what to do or where to go. You might get lost. Um, calling and talking to a voicemail instead of a live person, right? You can't <laughs> ask the voicemail questions. <laughs> um, Understanding that violence may arise from powerlessness does not excuse violent and hurtful behavior. Instead, it helps us move aside our bias and judgment of the behavior to genuinely connect with empathy. Um, power differences are systemic and are upheld by those in power who benefit from them. Um, a moment of connection can really help to restore our own and the power of others to see and act in more positive ways. Some helpful strategies here are to keep in mind what people are bringing into the space with them each day. Pause to assess the situation and what power dynamics might be at play. Distract or interrupt with kindness. Recognize feelings of powerlessness in your coworkers as well as your clients. How can you support the people that you work with and how can you act as a team? You know, Rebecca, I, I uh, had a very I think a similar experience to that this morning. So for those of you that aren't in Louisville, there's a there's a low bridge near University of Louisville that is affectionately known here as the can opener. Uh, because almost every week a truck tries to drive underneath it that can't quite make it and peels off the roof and has to get towed out. Um, normally, I this is kind of a amusing thing when I see it. Uh, this morning though, I was running late. This morning I was running late to work. <laughs> And I got to the can opener and there was a truck stuck in the middle of it with all sorts of police around and lights and traffic was stopped and all the things. And, uh, you know, my reaction, I got mad. I got, I got mad at this poor truck driver, which is probably having one of the worst days of his career. Uh, 
and I was I was frustrated because I was powerless to to do anything about it. I wasn't able to to make it to work on time, and I was worried about being late and all those things. Yeah, plays a, plays a role. Absolutely, plays a role. You still made it here before I did. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I want to mention is connection, and hopefully by now you're you're probably noticing two things happening. The first thing you're probably noticing is everything we're talking about isn't really disconnected from the other things that we've talked about. The environment, bias, empathy, culture, power, connection, they're all interwoven in, in intricate ways that are impossible to, to separate out. Uh, however, as adult brains work, we like, we like uh, sectioned out ideas, so that's kind of why this is broken down. The other thing I'm imagining that many of you are, are noticing uh, is you probably do a lot of these things already. The entire nature of a library is designed to be welcoming to people. It's designed to bring people in and say, this is a safe space. This is your space. Um, so I imagine that there's a lot of things that you're you're seeing that that you do already. And that's 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 kind of the the, the point of this this whole thing. Uh, connection weaves everything together. You can't understand other people without being connected to them, without learning about them. Uh, some key points we're really looking for is when you connect with someone, it can have a ripple effect. And this is uh, why the Wakanda Project started as an abuse prevention model. Um, there's research that shows that just by making a connection with somebody, it can have a ripple effect through everybody else that's connected to them in their lives. Uh, and often, that's a very positive effect if the connection that you formed is a positive one. Uh, this principle is all about suspending our judgment, understanding the impacts of powerlessness, environment, appreciating culture, practicing empathy and respect. All those cool words that you see uh, above uh, connection. Now, helpful strategies. The, nothing here is going to be new, right? Helpful strategies to form a connection. It's the same things we do every day. It's a look of compassion. It's a smile. It's eye contact. It's offering an encouraging remark or being sincere. It's identifying the source of stress and working to relieve that. It's all of the things that we do um, that maybe we do out of a sense of being nice or treating people the way that we want to be treated. Um, however, Research shows that this is really important to, to bettering a community and making a community thrive. So these are all kind of nebulous examples. Uh, let's look at a little bit of, of what we do uh, through Science and Play to Go, which is a uh, traveling early childhood, essentially a children's museum that comes to, to libraries all over the state. Uh, I see a couple names I recognize. Uh, Tanya, I know you just had it at Pendleton. Uh, Krista, you're, you're, getting, you're getting this exhibit on Monday. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, so uh, there's, you're going to see some examples of how we've, we've implemented these ideas and terminology uh, without, you know, beating down the, uh, the, the words of it specifically. So how have we tried to implement authentic connections in science and play to go? Well, I will tell you. Excellent. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> so this is a picture of our science depot. Uh, we have a lot of different materials out for people to explore however they choose. Um, this space helps caregivers to realize that they don't need a PhD in physics to help their kid discover what happens when they knock something off the table and it falls down to the floor. Um, and you can create a fun learning experience with things that you already have at home. Um, yeah. So anybody can, you know, anybody can teach science thinking. Rebecca, you want to control the next slide? I can so control the next slide. Yeah. yeah. Your mouse. <laughs> um, this is one of our play specialists taking extra care to make a really cool, fun, exciting environment for patrons to feel more immersed in their play. Okay, this is an example <laughs> of some of the items we might have out in our science depot. Um, these items are kind of related, but they're also open-ended. Um, adding materials that can 
open-ended and asking open-ended questions take the idea or the bias out of the idea that direct answer. We like to ask a lot of questions like, why do you think instead of why does this happen? Because um, there's, there's a right answer for that, but there's no right answer for why do you think mm -hmm. this turtle is bigger than the other turtle? Could be anything. <laughs> All right, this is our shop for shapes. This is a really popular one. Um, this is just a little grocery store, but instead of adding plastic cheeseburgers and boxes of cereal, we just have shapes with different colors and textures um, using the open-ended shapes that can be absolutely anything you want, allows for cultural differences in shopping experiences. Some friends here at the Shop for Shapes store it looks like they went shopping maybe, but now they're not shopping anymore. Now they're building. Um, we have a lot of people who use exhibits that we don't necessarily expect, right? Uh, this isn't a building exhibit, but we see people do things like this all the time. Um, I was at our rocket table earlier today and I noticed that somebody didn't build a rocket. They used the rocket pieces to build a person. <laughs> and I was like, that's so cool. <laughs> Right? Again, this kind of takes our bias out of what uh, we expect them to do and what we expect the right answer to be. All right, here we have some people at our Science Depot, um, adults and children creating some turtles out of paper plate. And they are all sitting at a tiny little table on tiny little stools that are very sturdy and can hold all of us grown-ups. <laughs> um, so this one I think is a little tricky. Um, we can put them both at the same table, right? But it might not be as comfortable for the adults. Um, so I don't know, this one makes me think that I think it's cool that they can be at the same table, but I also wonder if we could benefit from some uh, bigger seating, right? Size for adults. Last is our awesome giant light bright. So this is the first thing that you usually see when you walk into our science and play to go exhibit. Uh, and that's on purpose because nine times out of 10, it's the very first thing that an adult will go to. Why? <laughs> because it's super nostalgic and they're excited about it and it's familiar to them. Um, it helps them to feel more welcome in a space that's geared toward kids, right? It kind of draws them in and then you see them interacting with the rest of the exhibit a lot more. I think that helps to, to draw them in and make them comfortable. And again, we do not have all the answers and you know, these are things that we're still thinking about all the time and working toward. So back to our scenarios. So we're going to go back to our scenarios and I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you all to think about the scenario. Uh, in terms of environment. So what are some things that maybe maybe we could have changed in this, this mystical imaginary environment that I haven't described to you at all? Uh, what are some things that might have prevented this challenge from happening? Aside from changing our Wi-Fi password to <laughs> I should be playing with my children right now. from an environmental lens, what what might have prevented this? Do you have any ideas, Chris? Uh, well, um, I think I think maybe the thing that we might want to prevent is is not necessarily that an adult City. Oh, what do we got? Have activities that look engaging to adults and kids together. Yeah, totally. Right? Uh, I knew if we waited long enough. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, to have, have some activities that look exciting for adults. There's there's a lot of excitement that comes from my phone, right? There's 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 a lot of, of serotonin that pumps into my brain because of that. Uh, so if there's if there's other things that look engaging to adults, that look welcoming to adults, then yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What about from an empathy lens? 
What what might be th be thinking from an empathy lens here? Maybe maybe this is the uh, maybe this is the first time that that particular adult got to sit down and look at their phone in the past week without worrying that their kids are gonna you know jump off the roof. Yeah. Right. <laughs> maybe this is the first thing from from a cultural perspective. Maybe it's not the norm to play with kids as adults. Maybe it's not uh, an aspect of, of the culture that, that makes sense. So we can look at this through through a lot of different lenses. Scenario two, the yelling. What if we were to look at this through the, uh, maybe a biased lens? Mm -hmm. Adults don't want to look childish. Yep. <laughs> they might in public. You're exactly right, Becky. That's a good point. Yeah. They, they can't be seen playing with those childish things. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this is a scenario I've, I've seen frequently here. Yeah. Uh, man, bringing kids to a space a science center, a children's museum, a library, that is exhausting. Uh, it is, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you all have tried to bring children to a place. It is an exhausting um, thing. And uh, I, I, I saw this, this is pretty close to my heart. My dad is a very nice guy, uh, overly nice all the time. And he brought my niece and my nephew here yesterday. No, two days ago. Sometime this week, no matter. <laughs> he brought my niece and my nephew here and was here about 10 minutes before I saw him raising his voice because of all the stress, all the things that were going on, right? And of course, I don't want him to yell at my niece and nephew because that's not a super nice thing to do. But I I, I felt empathy for him. I, I felt empathy for, man, you must really feel like this is an out of control situation. So I like you know, what you all said earlier about trying to resolve the problem. Like the, the kid wants a book. Here's this book, right? Um, you know, maybe from an environmental perspective, maybe if you know that and we're in the spooky season, right? So all of the Freddy Krueger books are going to really get kids' attention. Maybe let's not have them, you know, at the front desk where kids really want them. <laughs> I'm sure none of y'all have Freddy Krueger books at the front desk. But if you do, let me know because I'm a big horror movie fan. <laughs> Maybe, maybe this is uh, maybe this adult just needs a little bit of love themselves. Maybe a comment of, "Wow, it was really awesome. You brought your kids here. Thank you for coming." Um, or, "Yeah, it can be really exhausting taking your kids out places. I'm so glad that you're here. It can really go a long way." Our final one. Enmeshed in a book, not paying any attention. Kids are starting to get pretty, pretty nutty. Approach with a smile, not a scold. Becky, that is such great advice. Um, what do we all do when we, when someone comes at us with the the anger face? Right? We all put up our defenses. We all say, "Well, I'm about to be attacked. I have to be. I have to be ready." Um, but a smile is a uh, is disarming, uh, for sure. Um, I like I like this scenario. The adult caregiver is mentioned in a book, um, and it's really easy to see that as somebody's not doing their job. Uh, however, how cool is it that this person thinks that your library is safe enough that they can relax? That this this space is is beneficial enough that they can allow their children to explore freely. Right. And I'm not Pollyanna enough to believe that every single person that lets their children run around crazy is going through that thought process. Um, but it's pretty significant. It's it's pretty significant that that maybe for the first time in a month. This this adult caregiver feels like they can let down their guard just a little bit. And that's a pretty powerful statement of of how people interact with our spaces. I'm 
obviously I don't want kids running around throwing everything they can reach onto the ground. Um, I like the redirections that you all popped into the chat earlier of let's find a game or let's find an activity. Um, or maybe maybe we find similar books to what our caregivers read. Who knows? There's there's infinite responses, right? But if we go through these scenarios with with some intentionality behind being overly empathetic, uh, a lot of really good connections can happen, and a lot of really really positive experiences can occur. So let's go back eventually to that email that I got a couple months ago from an emerging children's museum. Uh, so I responded back that, uh, you know, it's a great question. It's one that I've, I've asked myself lots of times in lots of different roles, but it may not be the best question to ask here. Uh, we may need to reframe that into, into two other questions. Uh, two other questions that we ask ourselves all the time here at the flagship and with Science and Play to Go. So first thing I challenge this educator to think about, how can I make this my space welcoming to adults? Good question. So the very nature of either a children's museum or maybe the children's section of your library is not particularly welcome to adults. It's, it's very welcoming to kids, right? There's lots of bright colors and loud noises. Uh, small furniture, things like that. Um, so there's some things that you can change in the environment, right? Uh, adult friendly seating, like I was talking about earlier with our own exhibit. Um, maybe coffee. I really like coffee. <laughs> Signage translating um, what's happening to a more stereotypical paradigm of learning. Um, some leading questions that they can use to interact with their kids that aren't as scary. Um, and, and sometimes just talk, talking to the adults can help. I know uh, for some people who work with kids, sometimes it's easier to talk to the kids instead of the adults. I am totally guilty of this. Uh, but when you bend down and talk to the kids and don't say anything to adults, right, it makes them feel less welcome. So just smiling and saying hi can automatically make them feel more welcome. The next question I challenge this educator to ask what do I know for sure about this family unit today? And this sounds like a really hard one, <laughs> but it's an easy answer. The only thing you really know for sure about them is that they are at your library, right? You don't know a lot more. Uh, you don't know how long it took them to get there. You don't know if little Susie uh, was crying for three hours because she couldn't find her shoe <laughs> and she really wanted to put her left shoe on her right foot, but it's supposed to go on the left foot. You don't know, right? Sounds like you're speaking from experience. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I certainly am. <laughs> um, you know, you don't know if they ran out of gas on the way there. I don't know, right? There's so many things about their situation that you don't know. But you do know that they packed their kids in the car and they drove to your library um, and they're out with their kids. And that in of itself is so cool. Um, that means that they're more engaged with their kids than all of the people that did not do that today. Uh, so. So yeah, very cool. Uh, so there's there's a lot of there are a lot of cool thoughts, and with uh, with any luck, you all have just sat through the past 43 minutes for no reason at all. With any luck, everything that we've said, you're thinking, yeah, I already do that. Yeah, this makes sense. It's it's common sense, right? And I think for these really common sense things, it makes a lot of sense to sometimes sometimes formalize it a little bit and, and be, be intentional about the things that we're already doing on a regular basis. So more information here, uh, a lot of words on this thing. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me or Rebecca, you have our email addresses uh, right there. Uh, if you'd like to check out Science and Play to Go, uh, it is currently in Pike County Library. And as of Monday, uh, we'll be in the Bracken County Library. So that's pretty exciting as well. Uh, there's also a, a, a sheet, a single page thing that you can download, uh, just some basic authentic connections stuff. But if you really want to do a deep dive, uh, there's this really long website. So I did a QR code instead uh, that you can find all the information from Ramsey County Department of Health. Uh, there's some, you can be for, for hours and days. So in the last minute before we have to roll, <laughs> 
Sorry, we're a little long-winded. That comes from being educators at the Science Center. Uh, in the last minute, questions, comments, concerns. Yeah, you can use the microphone. You can drop it in the chat. Um, if you don't have time now, you can send us an email later. What do you got? I, I believe in you all. At least one question. Chris really likes questions. I know. Don't make me pull out my kindergarten <laughs> skill sets here. I always say you explained it so well. There's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know what? You have deflected my question need with the compliment. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, folks, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Um, I hope that you're able to uh, engage some of these, these ideas in your own uh, places. Check out our Science of Play to Go locations in Bracken and Pike uh, counties. Counties was the other word of that. And feel free to come check us out here at the flagship. Uh, definitely reach out if you have any questions. And thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, right on. Awesome. Love to hear those things. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you both for being here and doing this for us.